Hello everyone, I'm your host as always, Mr. Lindley. Oscillations, physics unit or type of fan? Both seem plausible, but which is correct? For more, we go to our field correspondent, JJ. Thanks, Mr. Lindley. I came here to a meeting of the Oscillating Fan Club where I attempted to ask them questions. However, no matter what I asked, they always responded with no. Look, look, watch. Are you a fan? Do, do you provide cooling things during this hot summer heat? Are Cheetos delicious? As you can see, Mr. Lindley, they are uncooperative, so the world may never know whether or not our solutions is a fad or a physics topic. Back to you. Thanks for the effort anyway, JJ. We'll get all the answers we need from the classroom with Mr. Lindley. Thanks for the intro as always. I'm Mr. Lindley and here we are with oscillations. Oscillations. Let's get those equations up. And let's start to talk about, you know, why do we like oscillations so much? Do we like oscillations because that's what our emotions do on a regular basis? Do we like oscillation because it connects just about every unit we studied up until this point into one? Probably that second thing, right? So what really is an oscillator? An oscillator is something that has cyclic and repeating motion. So we're looking at it and we're seeing that it's cyclic and repeating. And for us, we talk about it being an SHM or simple harmonic motion. And that means that again, simple harmonic motion saying simple, it's, it's very standard, not too difficult. And harmonic motion meaning that it's moving in a cyclic pattern, in a cyclic fashion, makes it a lot easier for us to discuss. And, and Typically for us at, at this level, we have two main oscillators that we deal with, a spring oscillator and a pendulum oscillator. Now they're wildly different, uh, but also very similar at the same time. So with a spring oscillator, a lot of times, uh, you know, we'll have some sort of system where I will have a spring, right? And, and a block on the end of that spring and it's all squished. And then, um, the spring will unsquish, it will get to its equilibrium position, right? But then it's moving, so it's actually going to continue that motion, it's going to keep on going, and it'll get to some spot now where it is all stretched out. So I have the squish spring back at equilibrium, and then now where it's all stretched out. And this is sort of in comparison to our pendulum, where I'll have uh, some mass hung off the edge, and this uh, object will swing, right? And it will get over here to some other position. Now, how are these similar? How are they different? Big thing that we're discussing here most likely uh, for all both of these is energy, right? We could also discuss forces as well. <laughs> my cat is currently fighting something under my feet. Uh, and, you know, if we, if we start with the pendulum one, with this oscillator, you know, this would be uh, pretty simply gravitational potential, right? When it gets to this lowest spot, we would talk about it being kinetic energy, and then here getting back to being gravitational potential, okay? And it would just sort of go back and forth. And, and you can see we have, you know, our two equations that we, you can get um, from a lab from conducting this. Now, notice the thing that isn't in either of these is there isn't amplitude, or how much the pendulum's pulled back, or how much the spring is initially stretched isn't involved in either of these. Uh, and that's because if you think about what's going on with the, with the spring, if I actually stretch it more, it's gonna have more energy, but it also has further to move, right? So those sort of effects balance each other out. And the same thing with the pendulum, but you will notice that mass has a large effect, right? Uh, with the spring, but mass actually has no effect with the pendulum and similar uh, to, to uh, amplitude. With the pendulum, if I increase the mass, it would be more force, but more massive objects are also harder to move. Right? So, and, and with the spring, the difference is by changing the mass, I'm not actually changing the force. Changing the spring constant would actually change the force, which you can see uh, is in that equation. Let's dive a little bit deeper you know, into um, the spring oscillator and these sort of scenarios and, and really get uh, into the nitty gritty of, of what will be going on with the various things. Now let, let's start with energy because we were already there. So in this, in this, um, in this first scenario uh, right here, this would be all spring potential. Uh, 
Uh, and then here, so this is our equilibrium position, right? Here it would be all kinetic energy. And then finally, when it gets out here, it'd be back to being spring potential. So we're getting it that oscillation <laughs> between spring potential and kinetic energy. But the other thing I think that, that would be interesting and important for us to discuss with these Um, no, just, just, just draw, just be a drawer. So if we think about these scenarios, we can also then, if we're talking about energy, also talk about speed and all, and acceleration as well. Now, in terms of motion, when the spring is fully squished and fully stretched at, at those two uh, endpoints, we should actually see the velocity at, at those two spots uh, be zero for an instant, for an instant, right? That's all that should really be occurring there. Uh, and then in this middle spot, this is actually where we would see velocity uh, be a maximum. Because if you think about the spring is uh, no longer squished, but it's not quite stretched yet. So that's where it's actually going the fastest. Now this is uh, in stark comparison um, actually uh, to accelerations. Acceleration um, is at, at these outer points. Acceleration is actually a maximum at those outer points. When we think about why that makes sense, right? The acceleration is based off of force. And where is the force the largest on the spring? It's the largest at the two extremes. The acceleration would actually instantaneously be zero at that middle point because the spring is not stretched nor is it compressed. So because of that, uh, it, it's, we have that instantaneous zero acceleration. Now, how can we do anything with this? Well, we actually can use this in sort of in, in combination to figure out uh, how fast it's moving. So we can find the maximum speed. We also could find the mass, maximum acceleration. Maximum um, speed, we would use energy. So we could actually say that the initial spring potential of the system would be equal to the maximum kinetic energy, right? So I would have my equations. This is 1 half kx squared. This is 1 half m v squared and this would be v max we're looking at so that means this x would be max as well the maximum stretch or squish and i can then use that to solve and then if i wanted to try to figure out um f net well f net would be fs and then f net here is also ma meatloaf ma meatloaf mother's day is coming up Okay, um, so if I wanted to solve this, right, it would be that the spring force is equal to ma, so then this would be kx, and this would be max, uh, would be ma max. And I could use these two to figure out the maximum speed and also the maximum acceleration uh, for my spring system. So it's really uh, just sort of trading back and forth between spring potential and kinetic energy. For these. Now you notice the spring oscillator is horizontal. The reason we typically do that is to not uh, have the influence of gravity uh, going on in them. Now uh, next up important thing that, that we typically discuss with, with oscillators would be graphs. So what would a graph for the motion look like for an oscillator? So we would uh, have a position graph, we'll have a velocity graph, and we'll have an acceleration graph, and these will all be uh, time. Like how I scrolled and that was there. Preparation. Uh, let's do one full cycle uh, for this. So let's imagine, you know, if we think about it, uh, we'll have our oscillator start uh, at a positive stretch position, right? Uh, so that means that halfway through the cycle, it should be at a negative position and then it should make it all the way to the end. And, and I'll explain this in one moment. So I'm making dots here just to help myself out. Now we have it starting here and then what happens? So one full cycle, it should be back where it started originally, right? Halfway through the cycle, it should be uh, halfway, which is at this, the, the negative amplitude. And then in between those two spots is actually where it's going to hit um, a, a point um, of, of equilibrium, which is where x is zero. Now this graph actually will, difficult to draw in here, have a curvy shape to it uh, because the force is non-constant. It's always changing. Now easiest way to draw this uh, for me um, would be to change the color which it currently doesn't want me to do. No, you don't, why do I want to change the color? 
All right. Uh, drawing dotted lines are fun, especially when there's more than one, but only if there's less than eight. I hope that I don't hesitate. Because now we can think about those exact same scenarios. I'll change to a purple. Uh, at different moments. Now, whenever we said uh, at equilibrium position, right, that's where velocity was at a maximum. So then I know that, uh, you know, here at those two spots, right, velocity actually has to be a maximum. So velocity then should be zero here, zero here, and zero there, because we said velocity was a maximum when it's at the full stretch. Now, how do we figure out whether or not in this uh, this first interval it's a positive velocity, um, positive a velocity or a negative velocity maximum, we just look at the slope of this first graph. So you see this first graph has a negative downward slope. So that means for me, this is going to be a negative maximum. And here you can see a positive slope, positive maximum. And then we take this graph and we make it curvy. It's a curvy graph. Uh, now, wherever velocity is at a maximum, acceleration is zero and, and vice versa. So that means I'm going to get no acceleration here and then no acceleration here. And how on earth am I going to figure out the acceleration? The same way we figure out the velocity, what's the slope? And remember, Acceleration is the slope of a velocity graph. So right here we're seeing a negative um, velocity. So that means I'm going to get a negative maximum acceleration. Here we're seeing a positive value, so positive. And here we're seeing a negative value, so negative. And I'm going to attempt to curve this the best I can and have it connect like that. Now if you're looking at these graphs, you might notice they look a lot like sine and cosine trig function graphs. That's because they are! They look a lot like them because they are. It's like when you have something and it smells a lot like an apple because it's an apple. A little trick for you is that the acceleration graph should always look like a reflection in the t-axis of the position graph, which is certainly what we have here. Oscillations is one of those units where, again, we're bringing in energy, we're bringing in forces, we're bringing in kinematics, we're bringing in motion. We can talk about third law, we can talk about inertia. So many different ways we can connect various things here. So it makes it a pretty important unit for us to understand and get a full grasp of. Great. Uh, smash that subscribe and like button. I'm just going to point randomly. I, I have no clue where they are still. Uh, and until next time, thanks for watching.